Hello. How are we all going? Um, let me just get my bits and pieces set up. I should probably clear that secret stuff there. Um, I was just working on some lab question stuff for this week. Um, just making sure my G-Edit window is not clashing with the picture of my face there. Okay, welcome to the last week of term for Comp 1511. Today, I had some questions on Piazza about um, uh, asking if in the live stream we could go through some ideas for question four and five for the assignment. Uh, also today, we might talk about um, any questions people have about uh, what techniques or whatever I think should be useful for revision and things like that. We are going to talk about that in the um, in the lecture tomorrow anyway. Um, but I thought if anyone had any questions about uh, exam format and stuff like that, um, there'll be there'll be some stuff there as well. Uh, in your labs this week, we are actually going to be talking about uh, exam, in a sense. Well, not actually talking about it, we're just going to kind of give you a look at what it's like. So, um, in the labs this week, we'll show you what the exam environment is, and you can see what software is available in that, and, and what you can do with the terminals and the editors and stuff that we provide for the exam. It's just so that you don't get stuck um, trying to figure out what software to use once the exam starts. We want you to kind of have seen the environment. We don't want to test you on how well you can work in an environment you've never seen before as much as we're testing you about what we've taught you. Having said that, I should also say that um, learning how to code in an environment you're not used to is quite important. Uh, pretty much all job interviews for programming, you won't get to bring your own computer in and stuff. You will actually be expected to code on someone else's interfaces and devices. Or even worse, you'll get asked to code in something that is not an IDE. So something, well, we haven't really talked about what IDEs are, but um, they're, it's a, an acronym that means Integrated Development Environment. So if any of you have used stuff like Microsoft Visual Studio before, G-Edit, not so much, but you know you could still get asked to code in something that has no syntax highlighting, uh, no autocomplete or anything, like none of the things that we usually sort of take for granted as programmers. Um, people will test you under those conditions to see how much you know, uh, not necessarily how much you rely on the tools. So that's a really interesting thing that could happen to you. The exam's not that bad. We're not gonna ask you to code in a, um, in a word processor and we're not going to leave you without a compiler or anything like that. Um, in fact, the way that the exam is set up is going to be really, really similar to um, to our normal lab setup. You just have less control over the environment itself, and obviously we're not leaving you with Google available. So we're going to say that if you're, if you're going to show your own ability, um, you obviously have to show your own ability. So... Um, it is a useful skill in life to be able to find the right things on Google and to be able to use them. But in the exam, for this to be exactly fair and for it to just be on what you have learnt in this course, uh, we test it in a very pure way. So no outside information coming in. Uh, you just have to prove your own programming ability. Anyway, I shouldn't talk too much about the exam because I'm going to talk about the exam anyway. Um, when it comes down to it. So um, one of the questions that we had was asking about um, the late stages of the assignment and if I could talk through the way I might think about those things. I'm going to be limited in what I help you with here because in, in no way do I want to give away stage four, stage five. And actually a lot of the difficulty in stage four and stage five is actually um, how you were going to think about this. But I think it's worth me just talking about the general idea about, okay, what's a hard problem and how do we solve it? So, let me open the actual assignment spec 
and we'll have a look at what we've got here. Okay, I'm pretty sure that link goes to the assignment. I'm going to view it in browser because it's a bit small when it's in the tiny window there. Okay, so assuming that we've got a certain part of the assignment already done. So assuming that we already know stuff about adding to the realm um, and adding enemies and stuff. I actually think that one of the things that's, uh, that is the most difficult for people is the idea of advancing enemies. I think that's going to be one of the... Um, one of the sticking points between um, the idea of getting a, a credit and, and making your way up to a dis dis distinction level is the ability to move these lists of enemies. Um, maybe we'll talk about that later, because the question I got was about stage 4 and stage 5. So stage 4 and stage 5 are the more complicated things, and someone was asking me about, okay, actually, I wonder if it's in Piazza. Actually, I don't want to go try to search through Piazza because Piazza's got lots and lots and lots of questions about lots of different things at the moment. But I'm pretty sure the question, oh, unless the person's there right now, if you actually are in stream right now, you could probably repeat your question in the chat. But I think it was something along the lines of, uh, can Mark talk us through how we would go about thinking about solving these problems. You know, at least um, can, can, can Mark give us the idea of the philosophy of them and and the kind of um, thought process for them. So what we have in stage four and five is a series of reasonably difficult things to do. The first thing that we need to think about when we have a problem at this level is how are we going to approach it? So the first thing's always going to be, um, how, how are we thinking about the problem itself? Like we're not even thinking about code at all. We think about, do we actually understand what is being asked of us here? So stage four, I'm going to, let me see. Um, I don't think I've got, no, I don't have a directory yet for this stream. Um, I'm going to start a text file. This is not going to be a C file. I'm not necessarily going to write the code for this. In fact, I think for later stages of the assignment, I think it's, it's a bit unfair for me to write any code at all. So I may get as far as a sort of a pseudo code, but I might also just talk about the problem itself and how I might go about solving it. So I'm just going to open up a text file for stage four. So stage four of uh, castle defense. Oops. This is one of the annoying things about autocomplete is when you're writing in a text file and you have autocomplete on, it tries to complete to a whole bunch of random potential code words that you might have had. Okay. First thing, and this is always, this is always where I start. You know, I'll start with um, writing things down and or diagrams. Those are the ways that I'm going to start trying to think about how I want to understand something. So let's go back to the spec itself. Searching. Stage four and five rely on content search, described by a search term. Simplest case is just a word which should try to find an exact match. Uh, that's not entirely perfect English there, unfortunately. Yeah, for instance, searching for hi in this array of words would only find this one word here, hi. Won't find many any of the others because they don't match exactly. We want them to match exactly or not at all. Then we have special characters, a question mark and a star. Question mark means any character, which means we would find any single character to replace with the question mark. And the star means zero or more characters, which means you can have a whole bunch of characters, which you will just basically ignore in between the characters that you're trying to match. Um, so these are nice because they're actually in order. There's three levels of difficulty here. So let's start thinking about that. Okay, one, match a string, exactly. Two, is 
match string with one letter being a wild card, which is the question mark. Three, match a string with um, one or more. Is it one or more, or is it any number? Zero or more. Cool. Okay, so we're, we're clear on that, which is nice. Zero or more letters being a wild card. The beauty of a question like this is you know that you can get some of the marks by doing the easy thing. So you can do the easy thing and get some of the marks. But then what you can do is you can build this in such a way that you can build upwards to these two if you want to. So matching a string exactly. Um, okay, what I think I need to do. One, write a function that um, that matches strings. Um, that function, I'm going to say 1a, that function is probably going to loop through a pair of strings matching characters. Um, 1b, I might say, Sturkamp already does this. Do I want to use this? We get strategic now, right? Because, because you know, if you want to, if you want to, you can get strategic about everything that you do. You can think about, um, like trying to get marks in the assignment as being a challenge, purely in how many marks you can get. So. If we're running out of time, so right now we've got a week left, which means you're not running out of time yet. Um, but if I was running out of time and I had to submit this in, in a couple of hours, then I'd say, I'm going to stir crump this and I'm going to match the string exactly and that's all I need to do and I can get some marks for stage four. So... Well, not necessarily, it's more than that, but at least I can get this searching done. And if I can get this searching done to the point where I can apply buffs, so I can actually get this command to apply buffs, then I will be in a position where I could get some marks for stage four. It's hard to get marks for stage four if I haven't done the other stages though, because they don't really make sense. Like adding the buffs to things doesn't make sense if I'm not able to add the towers or the enemies. So if you can't add towers and enemies, then there is no way that the tests to see if um, the buffs worked will work. So this is the kind of thing where it's like, you really do want stage one and two to already be correct um, before you try to do stage three, four or five. But if we've gotten to the point where we've got the first three stages and we're like, can I get some marks here in stage four? And I have like two hours left. It's like, actually, yeah, maybe, maybe you could. So what do I need? I need a function that matches strings. Um, um, I need to be able to use that function. So um, I'm going to write it down explicitly. I need to write, what's it called? Apply buff. Apply buff so that it uses my string matcher. I'm gonna just call it string match. I don't know what you wanna call it. You can call it anything you want, right? Um, it is your function. So if I have a string match function, I'm gonna write it up here called string match need to write apply buff so it uses my string match. Um, so what's apply buff going to do then? Uh, apply buff will loop through all. So apply buff can apply things to enemy HP tower power, tower uses. So I have the realm that I'm going to look through. I have the search term, which is the string. I have the buff and the amount. So 
this buff, I would have to actually have a quick look at this and say, okay, what is that buff? I'm pretty sure that buff is going to be this hash define here. Um, and I might actually have to look at the code and see how this is going to be put together. So let's have a quick look. I think I have the assignment code. So I have the assignment code in a state of untouchedness, so I can open this one and show you without um, uh, without giving anything away. At least I hope so. <laughs> if not, this will be awkward. Um, let's open the realm.c and the realm.h. Okay, so realm.h does not have any of the information that I needed there. I think the stage 4 function is just going to be apply buff, search term, and then the effect. So what we're looking for is, what is this effect? Does, is there a type def for this effect? Uh, do, 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 do. Oh no, this is rom.c, sorry, rom.h. Right. So we have a couple of um, effects that we're going to use. Um, there's an N, an I, and a B here. These are the characters for the ice bounce and um, and none. These are the different kinds of towers. And we also have the buffs. Oh, actually, let's not look at effects for the moment because I'm pretty sure stage four is just buffs. So stage five is effects, stage four is buffs. So we're just looking at the buffs. Buffs are either going to... They're going to change the numbers that are in um, in some of the stats of the um, of the items. So the towers and the enemies are the things that can change. So I know that um, in my realm C, uh, where's my stage four? Actually, I'll go in the H. The H file is better. So H file here. So stage four. If the buff argument has different things, so it could be a tower uses, tower power, or enemy HP. So now I know that I'm either going to be looking for towers or I'm going to be looking for enemies, depending on which of these it's going to be. So I might actually just make a note of that. Um, so 2a, this is not actually 2a, this is going to be 2b. Figure out whether... I'm searching for enemies or towers. Because it's going to make a difference, right? I mean, it would be a very weird... Um, a very weird realm if the towers and the enemies had the same names. But it would be an interesting test case if we threw that at you and we said... Um, the enemies are orcs and the towers are orcs as well. And so then you really do have to make sure that based on the buff input, you decide whether or not um, you're searching for enemies or towers. So in order to do that, we would then go, okay, buff types. Where are they? C file? Oh, no, no, no. Defines are in the H file. I was like, you know, always going to be bouncing back and forth between these files anyway. Okay, so... We have hash defines here. You could use these as these numbers, but that's like super dangerous and it's much easier to just go, okay, these are the things we're looking for. So we got a buff and I think it was a capital B buff. Yeah. Okay. So see this type def, as I said before, any type definition is going to say, I have a particular type. And I'm saying that you can use it as a different type. So I'm saying that this capital B buff is a special type. And a special type that can be used specifically to to mean a... A buff is something that in gaming we, like, we think of as something that just um, adds to the statistics of, a, um, of an item or character and something. It's actually just an integer. It's just an integer, but we're going to call it a buff. So... What this buff does is it's represented by this 0, 1, or 2, but because of our nice defines, we're going to say it is a buff enemy HP or buff tower power 
or buff tower uses. So this is going to be the things that we're going to do our ifs on. We're going to say, if it's a buff enemy HP, then we search the enemies. If it's a buff tower power or it's a buff tower uses, then we're going to go and search through, um, uh, search through the towers. So stage four here, we can see that we will get told what kind of buff we've been given. So if we get the right one, um, we go into one part of our function, otherwise we go into the other part of the function. So find out figure out whether I'm searching for enemies or towers. Um, I don't know whether loop through is the next thing I'm going to do, but probably, I mean, like, this is why I write a planning thing, right? So I'm going to plan out my entire algorithm and then come back and decide what I'm going to do. So I might loop through all of either enemies or towers. and call string match. On the names. So we're trying to figure out whether the string that we've been given, which will be the search term. So character pointer is a pointer to the first character in in a an array of characters and so we can just treat this like a character array which is a string search term we're going to go looking at this search term comparing it to stuff in our realm and seeing if it matches the name of something so if we have a look at realm.c and our structs every location has a name so that's good this also gives you a clue enemies are going to have names as well. So that's something that you could say, okay, I mean, I, I'm assuming by now, if you're on stage four, um, you've already given the enemies a name. If you haven't, that's a freebie. You know, I mean, it's not that much of a freebie. It's going to be like right here. It's going to be saying enemy has a name. Do, 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 do. Create a new enemy location called name. Um... stats and stuff I mean there enemy arrow name it's it's like nearly spelled out exactly to you that the enemy struct was going to have a name field in it so you kind of already know that that's going to be there um, and if you haven't got up to enemies there you go I'm just explaining something to you but I mean it's, it's not that hard for you to figure out okay so the enemies would have a name, locations have a name. Okay, so that's fine. So we know that we can do a string comparison there. So I'm going to go through all of them, calling string match on the names. Um, oh, wait, I've changed my numbering here. So it was 2C then. Uh, now we should have a collection of which... Um, enemies, towers, matched. Although, I don't even know if we want to collect it as such. We might just want to process it as we go through. So, I might not actually collect all the things that matched. I might just leave them where they are and say, um, each time we match, we apply the buff. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail about applying the buff. It's going to change some numbers. Uh, I think that's something that you want to work out yourself. I'm not going to go into extreme detail on anything. Like I'm going to show you um, this overall viewpoint of thinking, but I don't really want to go too deep into this because I think this is something that if you do want a distinction or a high distinction, I think stage four and five is a high distinction or full marks. Um, the idea of what you ought to do is something that you should be working out yourself as well. But what I thought would be nice is like showing you what I do. So you can see like I've spent half an hour on this already. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm writing down all of my thoughts on how to do it. And you can see like if you just think about this document as I've been writing it, I write a line, then I delete it again, and then I change it and stuff, right? This is me thinking about what do I think will and won't work. 
So I said, I'll, I'll collect together all the names that match the buff. That means I'm going to make a new data structure with like uh, pointers to enemies or pointers to towers or something and then collect them with the, the things, whether they match or not. But I don't really think I need to do that because if I'm going to loop through them all, I'm going to see you one at a time whether it matches. So it's like just if it matches right then and there, I can apply the buff. So you can already see how I'm like, I'm, I'm structuring my program. I'm thinking about how I might want to do it based on, um, based on the information I get as I start to write down exactly what I want to do. This will get much longer, by the way. It will get much, much longer. So before I do something that's complicated like this, I'll usually have like a full page of stuff where I've gone, okay, now do this, then do this, then do this. Because a lot of this stuff, like in between each of these lines, there's these massive assumptions going on. So like I'm assuming that string match exists and then it works in some way. I'm assuming that I have code that can loop through Oops, I drag stuff around, it will actually move the text. So I'm assuming that I've already got code that can loop through and that I can match and then if I get the match, right? So I'm just talking over the code. This is, um, I don't know if people have heard of pseudocode. Pseudocode is a, is a term that um, gets used in very strange ways around the world. So some people treat pseudocode as if it's a fully formal programming language, like you have to do things correctly. Like pseudocode has to have these keywords and it has to use brackets in this way and stuff like that. But I'm just like the whole point of pseudocode is to write logic without having to worry about the syntax. So if you're worried about the syntax of your pseudocode, then that defeats the purpose of having pseudocode at all. You might as well just write code, you know? So this is my pseudocode. This is my, how do I think about a problem in a way that is reasonably formal and I can instantly translate this into code once I'm getting there. This is what I'm doing right now. Okay, so back to back to the problem itself. Okay, figure out whether I'm searching for enemies or towers, loop through the either enemy or towers, depending on what I was going to do. Every time we, we match, apply the buff. Um, technically, that's everything that I need to do. However, um, what is string match? Oh, actually, no, string match is number one up here. Okay, so we loop through a pair of strings matching the characters. I have a question mark there because I'm not sure if that's what I'm going to do. Um, string compare already does this. Do I want to use this? Again, that was a question of if I only want to match this case to match the string exactly, string compare will be fine. But if I want to do these, then maybe I want to loop through. So um, string match. How will this work? And I think that that's probably going to be the question that was being asked on Piazza was like, uh, if I have these weird wildcards, what am I going to do with them? So I have two strings, right? I have a search term. Uh, let's make these into possible variable names. I think it's actually called that, isn't it? Oh, where are we? Stage four. Searching, search term. Okay, cool, so I've got it exactly. Um, oops, sorry, opening the wrong window. Okay, search term is a string. Oops, <laughs> auto-completing. Uh, and location, it's not always gonna be location. <laughs> Doing the auto-complete again. So all of these are strings, which means we can match them against each other. Um, so search term, however, is a special string. Just um, put some white space there so this is in the middle of the screen. You can see it more easily. Um, search term is a special string that might, that might contain this or this, the question mark or the star. And so what we need to do is we need to say that a question mark can match any single character, star can match any number of characters, right? So we wanna, we wanna write that down specifically so that we remember it. Can match any character. The star can match um, 
zero or more characters. Okay, so this is... This is where I think if I tell you any more here, it's really going to... Um, it's going to take away from your chance to to learn how you want to do this. So I'm, I'm very, very tempted. <laughs> it's always like this. I'm very tempted to solve the whole thing here and now because this is a super interesting problem. I mean, this is... Um, I can't remember who came up with this. If this one wasn't me, this is one of your tutors that came up with this one and said, why don't we do this? This will be interesting. And I really, really like this because, as I said before, part one's easy. Part two is mildly difficult. Part three is devious and 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 wonderfully interesting. And it really kind of asks you, how good are you at looping? Like, you know, we can all, we all say, like, this is a while loop. This while loop goes through stuff. But it's like, can I loop at a different speed through different pieces of data at the same time? That's, that's like, I don't want to give it too much away, but that's kind of how you do this. So what we would do in search term is like roughly um, loop through all the characters in both words at the same time. Decide, I'm going to say for each character, decide if they're, if they match. So I'm not saying decide if they're the same, I'm saying decide if they match. Um, so, if I have um, uh, what were we using? We were using uh, university locations. So if I have one called electrical engineering and then I have another one called electrical engineering then these are going to be a match right so this is this is what i would call basic match and then i'm going to go match with a question mark so the question mark was specifically any character can match any other character so i can say oh you know what i'm going to be more specific with this this is the search term search term is electrical engineering and um, location name is also electrical engineering. So I'll just copy that here so that I can continue with my thing. Okay, so if my search term had, um, let's say it had this idea where it was just like, okay, I don't mind if they're capitals or not. So I'm gonna, actually going to take any letter here. So I'm going to say this would match, um, but another thing would also match. I know this will match, and I know that like that will match as well. So what I'm saying is, with this question mark, I don't care what this letter is. The rest of these have to still be perfect. The rest of these can cannot be different. But this one letter can now change to be anything that I want it to be. And I reckon if you're looking at this now and you're thinking about this in terms of like this idea that we're going to loop through all the characters and see if they match, you can already see how you could do this with the question mark is that if I see a question mark in my search term, I can probably ignore whatever letters on the other side. So I'm going to say if I see a question mark, then it matches. Because the question mark, question mark matches everything. I think it matches everything. Question mark means any character. So we haven't even been locked down to um, letters and numbers or anything like that. We haven't been told it has to be something specific. It could be any character, which means I can have I can have the following. Um, that matches as well. So I just put a new line in there but a new line is a single character and so it would match against the question mark so this hilariously messy location name which i think is actually impossible because you can't type this in and make it work 
So, so that one probably wouldn't work, but you could have, um, oh, another one that's definitely not going to work is you're not going to be able to fit a null terminator in there because the null terminator is going to make this string end here. So that's not going to work. All right. But there's other thing. Okay. Here's a, here's another one that you could use. That's not a letter or a number. You could have a space in there. Although I don't think our location names even work with spaces. Okay, we've been quite careful with this. So let's let's try for something that's not something that we would be using normally. There you go. There's an at. Um, so this is a valid string that matches this search term. This search term only matches against one string. That's the basic match that we were talking about, which is match the string exactly. But we have one letter being a wildcard. We can match any of these. Um, so match with star is a little different. So this is, this is what I do when I'm working out these things as I go, okay, let me get a really good idea about how this works. Let me get a good idea of the problem and how I want to fix it. So match with star, let's take the same search term here, but let's go back to electrical engineering and just put a star. In there and let's look at what things uh, I'm gonna take this one which is the exact match and see what things are going to match this first up this matches because the star could be any number of characters and E is any number of characters um, I could also have zero characters which means this matches this um, I could have many characters this matches so that's me basically rolling my face across the, i didn't roll my face across the keyboard but i just mashed the keyboard there this matches because specifically the star says zero or more characters so zero or more this is more than zero characters here and so this would match against the star the difficulty then is trying to figure out how this would work in code so this one's not too bad when we think about how this would, would work in code i know because like if i'm looping through two words at the same time actually from your perspective if i'm looping through two words at the same time like this and i'm matching character to character if the top one is a question mark the bottom one can be anything so that's pretty easy i can loop through there but if the top one is a star i don't know how far i'm going to go along the bottom so i might just loop forever on the bottom word, well not forever, but I'll just keep looping for an unlimited amount of time on the bottom word until it starts matching the top word again. So I'm looking for this N, because the N's the first letter that comes after the star. So I'm going through here and going, where's the N? And then I get some of this N here and I go, oh, okay, maybe we can start matching again. So the difficulty is if I have a bunch of N's in here. So I go, this wasn't matching then i hit the star and i start going through and going yep you all match you all match oh there's an n so i go on to the n and there isn't a g afterwards so i go okay that didn't match the difficulty with that is in that case this n still matches the star and so you got to keep going until you do or you don't match the end of this and i don't know if that's going to be the best way to do it i'm actually not going to tell you <laughs> there are other ways of doing it but i'm not going to tell you so what you're going to have to do is deal with this issue and the issue is that we could have any number of letters in here oh i'll show you one that that'll that'll really screw with you that's also legal so the word engineering in here could be in here but what we actually need is for it to be at the end because this is at the end so your star can do some really really weird things like that and you're going to need to be able to deal with that um i'm not going to tell you how because that's the whole point of this stage is that you like I, i'm happy to kind of talk about this one because this one's actually reasonably simple but um this one i'm going to say this is the problem and this is this is how how difficult it can be is that this section here matches the star because it is any number of characters. And the, the confusing and difficult thing is this really looks like it matches this. 
And then the second you get to that letter, you're like, nope, did not match because the original search term did not have anything after the G at the end of engineering. So therefore that means this whole section didn't match, except it does, it doesn't match this, but this matches this star still. So you're gonna have to deal with that and go, okay, so at the end, I should have the same thing. And the star could be anything in the middle, even things that are specifically designed to throw me off and make it really difficult to figure this out. So you're gonna have to find out a way of reading all of these letters in the space of that one. So we're not longer, we're no longer gonna have this happy thing of we're looping exactly through two words when we're looping exactly through two words and then we're in lockstep that would work for these first two but it's not going to work for this one here so this one here with the star is going to end up being something and i have to be able to figure out what i take um what i take into account and what i ignore in this pile of stuff and so the stuff that's really hard to ignore is the stuff that looks like it's correct um so up to you to see how you deal with that um there's many different ways of dealing with this. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I think I've said too much already. I didn't really want to um, give away anything about how this works. Okay, going back to the procedure. So when I'm problem solving stuff like this, I will figure out how this works. Oh, oh okay. Tom's just letting me know in these search terms, there will only ever be a single star. So we're never we're never gonna test you on the following. Right, this would be this would be a lot of code. This would be this yeah. This would be this would be doing me a bamboozle, this one. Because this would be Okay, there, and then if I get these four letters, then I move to another one, which could be anything, which could contain, say, this patch here, and that would confuse me, or could, could, could contain this, and yeah. So, this won't happen, don't worry, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, Tom's just letting me know that we limited it to a single star because it's actually hard enough as it is. Oh, he also said that he's just about to update the spec with more info about this. So sometime in the next day or two, um, the, the spec will have um, uh, have something that says, we're not going to throw this mess at you as a search term. Search terms will only have a single star, if anything, because it's hard enough as it is. Honestly, it's hard enough with a single star. Um, okay, so... When I'm thinking about this, I will actually think about how to solve this problem. So I won't leave this like this. I will write down something along the lines of, how do I deal with the star? Do I loop through and pause at the star and do something else? Um, do I come up with another candidate solution that might do it? Um, what about this other zany idea I just came up with? So <laughs> what I'm doing right now is I'm typing these things in. In my head, I am actually thinking about solutions right now. So I know three different approaches I might take to this. And I just thought of them as I wrote that, but I didn't want to tell you what they are because that just ruins the assignment for you. Like it's, this is up to you to, um, to decide how you're going to approach this and whether you want to, um, um, whether you want to think of other things. Uh, this is the other one, the fourth one, which is the, the last option in all possible cases. Do I want to read more? about uh, strings and wild card characters in searching? Um, the answer to this is sometimes yes and sometimes no. If you've got a candidate solution here in these where you're like, do I do this or this or this? And you think one of them's probably gonna work, 
then it might be worth trying that before you go and um, and read up on things. It's it's a back and forth thing. Like sometimes I will like read up on things. I will definitely read up on things before I before I um, implement them just because I think I've got a good idea about how to fix it, but I want to see if it's the same idea that other people have. Um, the downside is if you read up on things before you've thought about the problem properly, you might solve the wrong problem because people online are not solving the same problem as you. And if they're not solving the same problem as you, they'll solve it in a different way that makes sense to them. And you won't necessarily know whether it makes sense or not until you've turned over the problem in your head on your own. So I had a couple of ideas here. So this is one idea that I had that was gonna do a certain thing. And another idea, which was a zany idea, it was a super zany idea, but I think it would definitely work. And this, personally, is the one that I would implement first. This is actually really, really funny, by the way, because I'm actually thinking about concrete ideas here, but I'm just obfuscating it so that you can't see them because I don't want to give them away. But I'm pretty sure that I would attempt to implement the zany idea first. Okay, so what do I do next? I start a new project called string match I nearly always do this where I'm like if this is big and difficult enough I often don't want it messing with my other code and also I'm not 100% sure of my other code so I don't know whether it'll work or not what if I don't know whether I'm looping through enemies properly or not because looping through enemies is super difficult because the enemies aren't in a single list like the locations are so if i want to loop through enemies i've got to go to each location loop through all the enemies in the location and then see if they match and i'm just like am i sure that code is correct i'm not sure that code is correct so what i do is i just hop out somewhere else sometimes i'll hop out somewhere else or sometimes i'll write unit tests within the code and string match will be a separate function um but I like it clean sometimes. So I would start a new project, project called string match. Um, I will set it up the same way that you set up your lab exercises. You know, your lab exercises, you're always like, make a new file, um, call that file this and run auto tests on it. You don't have auto tests for this. You're gonna to have to do it yourself, but that's fine because you know whether string matches or not, right? Because you've gone to the trouble to go, what are these things? Do they and do they don't? Do they or don't they work? I have a good understanding of the problem I'm trying to solve before I solve it. If you've got a good understanding, then you can do your own testing. So uh, it will. I'm going to number these again. Create a list of strings. Take a string as input. Uh, let's say it prints out each string that it matched on a separate line. You can probably find this code because I can't remember exactly, but this may have been a lab exercise or a weekly test or something. You've probably already written this code. Right, so we can start from something that you've already written. We can go, okay, let's find that thing that matches things. I mean, like this, when you think about it, uh, a linked list um, and then a string's input and go through and see if anything matches that. Um, if, I, if, if I just go through, um, strings in linked lists linked lists would be like just 16 or 15 ah uh, the battle was the battle linked lists i don't know let's have a look um print players that loops through insert new after insert a list in its correct alphabetical location so there's a while loop that goes through a list until it reaches its end and stops anytime the input name matches this other name so with a little bit of modification, I can take this code I've written before and say, I'm going to loop through this thing and I'm going to find the ones that match, right? So that's actually there. 
Um, I think remove play is even easier because it's like loop through. Oh, it's the same loop. Same loop. Stop when you find the thing that matches the name. We're not going to stop in this because we want to loop through and find out all of the strings that matched, but we can still do a similar thing where we can go, all right, I'm just going to steal this code I've written before. So I know that I start off with the head of the list and I loop through, and each time I loop through, I go to the next one, and I stop if it's null. And then this thing, because I don't want it to stop, I might put it in an if statement inside saying, if the string compare was the same, I then output. So I already know that I've got code that can do that. The, the other thing, however, is instead of strcomp string compare, I'm going to have my own function. So I will write a function that replaces strcomp you don't necessarily have to replace strcomp precisely you don't have to do the zeros and the ones in the same way they do you can have your string match function in some way so that's going to be the thing that goes in your if statement your if statement's going to say does do these things match um then i'm going to test this lots and write pieces of it one at a time so, let me, 6 is just going to go on its own line down here. So, 6a is going to be whole complete string matches. This should be super easy. So, this is just going to say, um, if both strings are exactly the same, we match. Uh, 6b is going to be if there's a question mark in the search term it automatically matches anything in the um, in the other string um, and this way I can build this up and so like in between 6a and 6b test lots to make sure it works because if it doesn't work this one can't possibly work if there's anything wrong with this then you won't know whether this thing that you just added to it works or not so this is like like you know like i think i've said this every week nearly every week every time we start to write code so there's some weeks we haven't written new code we've been going on with old code but even then i may have said this as well every time you've got something break it up into parts yeah Make sure every small part of something works before you make the next part. So the question mark then automatically matches anything in the other string. Then again, test lots to make sure it works. So the kinds of tests we might do. Um, put a question mark in somewhere in a pair in a search term. test positive and negative results put question marks on either end of the search term uh, and and this is the best one you always need to make sure you do this when you've added something like this test a search term without a question mark because <laughs> Because one of the funniest things that we do is when we add this feature in, we break this one. Like, it's just, it's like a really standard thing we do. We add the new feature and we've broken the old feature. So you got to make sure that when you test it, you go, you go back and you test the, the thing that, that didn't, that wasn't there before. And then when that's all working, you will, you will go back and I say when that's all working, it's like six hours later when that's all working. Um, then you can be like, okay, I think these two are working now. Um, you've got different options here. So, options. Do I go on to the stupidly hard star match? Or... Do I integrate this into my realm.c now? 
I mean, te I'd be tempted to integrate it in the realm.c here after I'm sure that's working and then come back to my test, test this one and then integrate there. Because if you integrate this into your realm.c and then you get like, I don't know, a friend of yours says, here's a ticket to the coolest movie that's going to be released next year and the studio is allowing us to see a pre-release version. It doesn't even have all the CG rendered in it yet, but they want to use us as a test audience. And this is like the greatest moment of your life. And you're like, I am taking this opportunity. Then at least you got the marks for this part of it before you moved on and stuff. So at least this bit was integrated in, even if this bit wasn't. So sometimes it's like every bit that you know works, you go across to your realm.c and you put it in there. So you go, I know that my string match works. So my string match function, because especially because it's like a, a standalone function, because we, we, we made the function that replaced stircomp. And so if we've made that function, it means that we can take the header for that function and the body of that function and chuck it in our realm.c. Like if I look at the realm.c here, add prototypes for any extra functions you create here. So I know where I'm going to add the um, the first line of my function, the declaration of the function. And I think down the bottom here somewhere, these are the provided functions that we don't modify. Add definitions for your own functions below here. Um, and then we'd make them static. All that static does is just says they can only be used within this file. And that's fine because we don't want our string match to get used by other things. We only want our string match to be used specifically by our apply buff thing there. So we could put that in there and we can go, okay, let's start doing our apply buff work. Um, so the nice thing is that work that I did over here with the string match I don't need the work for the creating the list of strings and take the string as the input and the printout and stuff. But what I'm testing is this replacement for stircomp that I've created. And that's totally worth using. Um, then once I've got all that going, I can come back in here and do my auto tests. And I can see, oh, look, I'm actually passing like three quarters of the auto tests for buffs right now. I mean, depends. Depends on how much of this you've done because this is also going to have buffing locations or buffing enemies and depending on which one of those you're buffing it's going to run slightly differently so you need to make sure that you're um that you're doing that and thinking also about that thinking about how you'd separate things into functions but that's something i leave with you because i think that's something that's um that's up to you to figure out exactly how you're separating these things and also stage four and five like you, you're asking about high distinctions and full marks here so I'm not really going to give you the answers. Whereas what I'm giving you actually is something that everyone can use in every part of the assignment, which is not the specifics of this, but thinking about what my procedure is for solving something that I can't just solve by looking at it. You know, if someone says to me, loop through a linked list and print out all the names, I'm just like, I'm not writing a plan for that one. I can do a while loop through a linked list and stuff. But someone says to me, match two strings exactly with wildcards, I'm like, what wild cards? Tell me exactly how those wild cards work. I want to know exactly what I'm doing. I want to go through this process and go, do I fully understand it? Do I need to go back and forth and read the spec again and say, oh, okay, they gave us some examples. So do these examples fit with the view of the problem that I have? Because I've created this view of the problem here that I think is correct. I need to go back and forth and say, does this fit exactly? And also I might find that I've made a mistake in here. So what if I made a mistake like this? I made a mistake and allowed the question mark to match multiple letters. If I've done that, I've actually probably solved this. So I might have worked a lot harder than I needed to. But what if I did something like this and I said it can, it can match multiple letters? And then I come back in here or I integrate this whole thing. I start running auto tests, the auto tests start failing. And then I'm like, what's going wrong? I was pretty sure I had this. One of the biggest issues with logical errors in coding is um, not understanding the question properly. Like we accidentally misunderstood the question and we didn't answer the question we were asked to do. Um, question or specification. Usually it's the specification. It's like, okay, we need this button on the website to do this. And then there's been a misunderstanding of what 
what it was it actually was supposed to do. And then we have to come back and go, oh no, they gave us examples and they were really specific. So the question mark A does not find this one. Yeah, so that implies the question mark is a single letter, except it could be any of those different letters. So that's a useful thing to know, right? And so this is why I spent so much time thinking about the problem before I started um, uh, before I started actually implementing anything. So, couple of things. Um, we're about to go on break, but like, let me just summarize. Summary of approaching difficult problems. Um, so, one, write down the problem. Two, gain a solid understanding of what your code needs to do oops so it's 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 quite important for us to be able to say we've we've looked at several different examples and we've got a decent idea i went over them pretty quickly here i would actually take take longer time than this because i'm just like i'm gonna squeeze this into a live stream so i'm just gonna do this pretty quickly but you can see i've already written like 100 lines of stuff just about what I might do. And I haven't even gotten up to this bit, which is like, which that zany idea you were talking about, Mark, or how do I come up with another candidate solution? Is this the way that I want to do it? I don't know. I actually literally don't know because I haven't completed um, stage four of the assignment. I've been writing more questions than answers. You know, that's, that's my job, right? So I've been writing more questions than answers here. So I haven't implemented this bit. I just think that it's a really good exercise. Um, so what I, I think is like, maybe this would work, but maybe it won't. I don't know. I don't necessarily try this. This one I'm actually quite sure will work now, now that it's been spinning around in my head for a bit, but I haven't told you what it is. So that's, that's for you to work out. So, um, what I want to do is write down the problem, gain a solid understanding of what my code needs to do, um, come up with some ideas of um, how I want my code to achieve its purpose, um, test properly which might involve separating my new code from complex other bits and pieces around it. So this is me talking about here, starting a new project where I make the function string match and I make my own um, main files that um, uh, that is going to actually run tests. Oh, I've got a question there from Cameron B. Do we still cover manipulation of files in 1511? Cameron, no, we don't. Um, where's this question coming from, Cameron? Are you um, someone who's going to take 1511 or has just recently taken, maybe took 1511 last year or something? Sorry. The Yeah, oh, actually, we have shown it. Oh, you, you did 1511 last year, maybe. So maybe Cameron did it last year. Okay, so yes, we did actually do file reading and writing and stuff like that. But um, this year with 1511, um, we have shown it in a very oblique way where some of the lab exercises have file reading in them, but the file reading and writing there is actually already written for the students and the students can then um, then do it if they want to. Um, but it's not really, it's not it's not core to, to what we do in the, in 1511 at the moment. Okay. Um, I think there's not actually much else I wanted to say about approaching the difficult problem, except if I have separated my code into something else to test it, um, I can also say here, uh, reintegrate the tested code into the bigger project and test it all again in the environment it's meant to work in. 
So the way that we do this lets us make assumptions at certain points that other parts are going to work because we've tested them. It also lets us have a really good idea of what we're doing before we do anything. So we're not going to jump into the code sort of blindly. Like sometimes we get a situation where we will jump into code um, and just start writing code without a full understanding of what the problem is. And when we do that, like, I mean, I've said this before, this is this is a very dangerous proposition. If we don't understand our problem, we don't understand our potential solution, we start writing code, we're just going to solve a different problem. You know, it's going to be like, that doesn't fit at all, but we're going to do it anyway by accident. So if you if you follow this kind of approach to problem solving, it should work pretty well, especially when we're talking about these harder sections of the subject. Or not even like something that you'd consider is objectively hard, like what we say the later stages are objectively harder than the easier stages. Any point at which you feel like you're not in a full understanding of what's going on, this will work. Because this is just a way of us taking all of the parts of a problem and breaking them up into understandable chunks where it's like, I will understand this part here, coming up with ideas of what I want my code to do, I will always be able to do this better if I've already taken my time to gain a solid understanding of what my code needs to do. And so this is the kind of thing where it's like, okay, problem is really difficult. Um, I'm not seeing how I need to solve this. Go through the step by step. So write down what it is and find out exactly what it needs to do. So that's like going to the spec and reading it and writing down, okay, these are the things I want to do. And then coming through and working out how you want to put it together and making sure that you break it up into easy pieces. Oh, I should have said that actually. Idea, ideas, how I want to, my code to achieve its purpose. 3a because I've already gone on to 4. Actually, no, I'm just going to make that 4 and this 5 and this 6. Break the problem into parts. Decide which are the most important. Um, and I'm going to say build up from a base. So you get this kind of thing where this searching thing, it had a base, which was like the exact match. And then this extra match would only work if the exact match also worked. So matching with a question mark is only going to be successful if we know that matching the rest of these things is also going to be perfectly correct. So we need to do this first before we can do this. So being able to separate your things into, into nearly into stages, like the way we separate the assignments, or the, you know, like the whole thing, right? Everything that we do when we're teaching this stuff is 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 based on this. So it's 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 saying to you, um, if we'd given you the whole assignment and just said, here's a list of things that you need to do, you would have had to break these up into stages and you would have found the stages would naturally have ended up very much like our stages here. Because like we can't do anything until we add things to the realm, we can't add towers and enemies until the locations are there, um, we can't do damage until the towers and the enemies are there, all that kind of stuff. So with your own problems, you can also do this same kind of breakdown um, and, and it will help you solve them. Anyway, got gone way over time for the first hour, so I'm going to take a five minute break and we'll come back after five minutes. And if anyone's got any questions that they would like me to answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cameron said, where's the donation button? I am actually getting paid by UNSW to do this. So I am not accepting donations. Um, <laughs> this is a, this is a service to the students that goes along with the uh, with the course. But anyway, we'll take a five minute break. We'll come back afterwards and um, and continue. Yeah, like, share, and subscribe. Um, you can actually subscribe if you want to, but I mean, this set of streams is not going to go on for much longer because we're already in week ten of the term. I will probably still do one more stream after week ten though. But anyway, we'll be back in five.
All right, and we're back. Okay, so we talked about generic problem solving for stage four. We talked about um, how we might actually go about this whole searching string matching thing. Um, there's a question about stage five as well. So let's have a quick look at stage five. So stage five is changing a tower's effects. So we're gonna search for the towers by name and then change them to a new type of effect. Um, I don't need to say anything about searching to find the right tower and flicking over the effect because I think that that is reasonably self-evident from what we talked about here, about stage four. The, the thing, however, is let's look at what the actual effects are. And we've got these nice diagrams for them as well, which is nice. Um, it's like, oh, who made these? Sorry, I made these diagrams. So we have two types of towers that a tower can be converted into. One is an ice tower and the other is a bounce tower. And so the ice tower says, if an enemy would move from this tower to the next, and that enemy has less HP than this tower's power, it stays at the current tower. All other enemies move normally. Well, I could say all other enemies move normally, but I would actually say all other enemies that are not also affected by another ice tower would affect norm would move normally. Oh no, no no sorry, we're talking about all other enemies at this tower's location. So this should actually say all other enemies at this tower's location move normally. Um, because the enemies that aren't at this tower's location will be affected by whatever other things are happening. Okay, so enemies at every location must be sorted alphabetically. You should ensure that this movement preserves the alphabetical ordering of enemies. Okay, so let's think about what could possibly happen here. So we've got an example here, which is reasonably easy um, to understand, where the quad has an ice effect tower in it. That's probably just the shade from the quad building in winter, makes it frozen and icy. And the power of the ice effect tower is three. The goblin has three hit points, but the orc has five hit points. So, um, when the advance command, so the advancing enemies here, advance enemies command happens, these effects take take place then. So this is in the enemy movement phase. So when this orc tries to move, its hit points is higher than the power of the tower, so it gets to move. The goblin's hit points are not higher than the power here of the ice tower, so it can't move. It gets stuck there. Um, so the, the idea is it's sort of frozen in place. The tricky thing that then potentially happens here is if this next tower has, um, has some enemies already in it, then we need this orc or however many things move from this tower into this tower to be inserted into this list alphabetically. So the question I would have is, do I know of any way of inserting into a list alphabetically? So a lot of people, I think, at this point are going to um, uh, think about looking up searching, uh, sort of sorting algorithms. Uh, and if you want to, you can look up sorting algorithms. They're interesting. Um, but they take a lot of learning before you have a full understanding of how they work. So I wouldn't suggest that we go into sorting algorithms here unless maybe you've had some experience with them previously. I should also say that you do not need sorting algorithms to make this work. The reason being is that we've guaranteed to you that every time we give you a list of enemies, it's already sorted. So let's go back to, let's go back to let's say I think it might be lecture 16 but I'm not sure oops so the the battle the battle royale that we are creating so this is the second part of the battle royale I actually could have looked at the first part of the battle royale we were inserting alphabetically in this example so we had a function called insert alpha and we had insert, which was just going to insert um, into the list at some point, but then insert alpha replaced that. And that was saying, given 
an input name and given a list that you're going into, we can search through the list until we find the right place for our input name. If we find the right place for our input name, then we can insert the player into that. You'll note that this is nearly exactly what you need to keep these enemy lists um, uh, alphabetical. You don't need to sort them at all. Um, you don't need to create the list and then juggle it around, nothing like that. All you need to do is say, if the list is already in alphabetical order, and that I insert an element into it that keeps it in alphabetical order, it's still in alphabetical order after that. So all I need to do is make sure that I'm inserting in the right place. And this code will pretty much do that. So it's a matter of taking this and saying, how would I convert this code for use in the assignment? So where are we? Oh no, not looking at those text files. I'm gonna close this one because this is the older one, I think. And so I need to make sure that with the ice tower, I figure out who moves and who doesn't. And then whoever moves gets removed from this list here and then gets inserted alphabetically into this list here. And remember that when we worked on this, we could insert into an empty list and it would still work. So I think here it was insertion happened at the start of the list, whether it was empty or not. Um, so yeah, that's actually all that's happening there with the ice, diagram, ice, um, um, the ice tower. The other tower that we could use is the bounce tower. So the bounce tower has an extra complication going on in it. Um, I wonder if I should write some of this stuff down. Oh, it's all right. The whole point of this being interactive is I'm talking about it. You can always go back and listen to it again if you miss anything. So the bounce tower has this rule where it says, hang on, let's go read the actual rules. It's always, it's always important to read these things, especially like we're getting to stage four and five. This is like the most complex things in this assignment. Um, I fully understand if you look at stage four and five and you say, I don't think I can do that. Um, that's a bit weird. I don't know enough about programming to be able to make these things happen. I'm okay if you feel that way. You know, you don't actually need to even look at these stages to pass the assignment. In fact, if you're, if you're like, try to pass the assignment and you've got a lot of other time pressure going on, like you've got other assignments um, from other courses that are, that are taking a lot of your time, or um, you have things that you think you need for the exam, like there's a lot of basics that you want to learn and stuff, I'm more than happy for you to say, this is as far as I go. You know, I go to stage three and this is as far as I go and I need to get this handed in so that I can move on to other things. I know that there's something missing with the way that I'm working with strings and stuff and so I'm going to go back and study that instead. I'm going to go back to the lab exercises from like week four and five and I'm going to go back and look at those and that's totally fine. Um, because when you think about it, Okay, going back to the whole strategy and stuff, the whole strategy for university, you've got that kind of thing where it's like, how do I get the most marks in this subject? Um, how do I get the most marks in my degree overall? And then the other strategy, which is actually much more important, how do I learn the things I'm actually going to need <laughs> later on in life? Because getting the most marks and learning everything that you need, need later on, and they're not always the same thing. And it's unfortunate, but that's kind of the way that things are structured, um, is that we try to get you to do things by giving you marks for things, um, but the way that you do them changes how valuable those marks are, really are to you. Uh, the weekly test is a perfect example. So I've, I've already watched a lot of people and I've been wondering whether or not to actually just take all the marks off for a lot of people for the weekly tests, because there's plenty of people that aren't doing them in one hour. And I've been thinking like, yeah, if you're not doing them in the correct one hour, I could just zero out all your weekly tests because they're meaningless if you don't do them like that. But I don't know, I'm not necessarily going to do that. But um, there's two ways to do the weekly tests. There's to do them exactly in the one hour and, um, and have it finished and just hand it in at that point. And then the marks that you get for the weekly test, that little bit out of, out of seven marks out of your total course, which is not much, tells you reasonably well which bits you know and which bits you don't know. If you take, say, 13, 15 hours to do your weekly test, A, that's a huge chunk of your life you've just lost for a very, very small amount of marks, um, but B, you don't know what you don't know now. So if you don't know what you haven't been working on, then you're stuck 
you know, because you'll get to study for the exam, and the exam's worth 53%? Do you remember, Tom? Yeah, I, can't. Right. I think it's 53% of your total mark, and then you'll be throwing a large chunk of that by not knowing what you should or shouldn't have studied for. In fact, you'll throw much more than you could have earned in the weekly tests. So that's that's one of those things where it's like, going for marks in the weekly tests actually costs you long term because not only does it cost you marks in the exam it's going to cost you marks well not marks it's going to cost you learning because you won't know which bits of it you didn't understand from this course and like two years down the line when someone says you know you're happy looping through a linked list and just removing parts of it right and it'd be like um not sure i think i cheated on that weekly test and googled it and then just like typed in something that someone else wrote. So I didn't fully understand it. And I didn't know that I didn't understand it. So I didn't, didn't actually study for it later. So there's a lot of the idea of like strategy, right? The idea of like, how do you focus on what you want to do to get the most out of things? Sorry, that's where I was going before. I just went off to talk about the weekly tests and things. You can do the same thing with a castle defense. You can say, okay, I'm going to stop at this point and then I'm going to learn something else instead because there's only so much linked list manipulation that i can survive and i'm sure there's a lot of people in the course who are like there's only so much of linked lists that i can actually do and i'm hoping i won't have to do that much in the exam at the end so linked lists are a part of the exam obviously we wouldn't have spent like four weeks out of a 10-week course teaching you how to do something if um if it wasn't important uh linked lists are actually quite important too the continuation of anyone's studies into theoretical computer science. Um, it's not just theoretical, like I say, it's all the practical as well. But if you're going to go into the more theoretical side of things, linked lists expand into a whole field of thinking. Um, things like finite state machines and graphs and stuff like that. But I digress. So when you decide that that's as, that's as much as you're going to do, you don't actually have to necessarily look at um, stage four and five. Um, it's entirely your choice, but I had a question about it, so I thought I'd talk about it a bit. So, <laughs> back to the problem itself. The bounce towers. So what the bounce towers do is, instead of moving from this tower to the next tower, so if I have a bounce tower here, and these two enemies want to move to the next um, next tower. So let's say there's a tower here. We just didn't put it in the diagram because it wasn't necessary. It wasn't going to be part of this interaction. Instead of moving to the, this tower, they instead get bounced um, backwards to the nearest tower before the current one. The enemy may skip over multiple lands to reach that tower. If there are no towers between the current one and the lair, the enemies move back to the lair. Again, enemies at every location must be sorted alphabetically. So, Bounce Tower doesn't have the Ice Tower's power check, so you the nice thing is you're not going to be splitting the list. You don't have to remove from this list and insert into the other list. However, you kind of do, because you're going to have to remove everything from the list. So this entire list is going to bounce back to the nearest tower here, which means what we're going to need to do is take each enemy from this list and insert it alphabetically into this list here. First thing you need to do is you need to be able to find this tower. So you need to go backwards through this linked list until you find a tower, except that doesn't entirely work, does it? Because there's no pointer going backwards. So the other way we can do this is we can go forwards through the linked list looking for towers and we can try to track which tower is the most recent tower before this tower. But I'm gonna leave that to you. You're gonna have to find a way to figure out which tower is the tower just before the bounce tower. Or if there is no tower before the bounce tower, then you're going to want to have the location of the lair as being the position that these things will move to. Then you're gonna take everything that was going to move past the bounce tower, so we called it Bongo. Get it, Bongo? Bouncy drums, anyway, yeah. Um, Bongo is a bounce tower, so they don't move on from Bongo. Instead, they move back to whichever location you've decided they're going to be. So this is like a multi-part thing, right? So we've got to first figure out where they're going to go, and then we have to move them. And in order to move them back to that tower, we have to integrate them into the list that was there, which means we're going to need to do that similar thing that we are doing before, which is to say, insert this alphabetically into that list. Strangely enough, we've got some code for that here, but it's up to you to figure out how you make that work with a whole list of things inserting 
into a potentially a whole list of things. I mean, it's not that hard to think about. I would probably just go through and do them one at a time, remove them from this list one at a time, and stick them in here to make sure that we get each and every one of them, and they're all alphabetically correct in there. Um, yes. Okay. That's all I'm going to say about assignment two. I think um, I've talked about exactly what the problems are. Um, I've gone through some some details here about how I might go about solving problems, how I will pull a problem apart. I think this is the thing here because like as much as like you like you might like the example that I've done here, which is of this specific problem, I think what's more important is you think about how do I solve any problem? You know? And it's all about gaining an understanding of the problem, figuring out some ideas about what you want to do, not just one idea, but some, because you know that your first idea might not be the one that solves it, and so you need alternatives. And thinking about all the different alternatives to how to solve something is really useful, because if you've thought about many alternatives, then um, then you might actually gain a better understanding of the problem. Then we decide how are we going to solve this problem? We're going to break it up into small pieces so that we can solve only parts of it at a time. It's nice and safe. Um, and each part we build, we're going to test to make sure it does exactly what we think it does before we start trying to reintegrate it into a bigger, a larger work. Um, so it's always about knowing what you're going to do, breaking up into small bits, and then doing them and making sure they work before you move on to other bits. And that's going to be like, I mean, like honestly, like I feel like that's one of those things where if that's what you learned from 1511 and you didn't actually learn how to write C, you're not doing that badly. I mean, you might fail the course <laughs> because you should actually learn to write some C in this course because I did do a lot of it. I did a lot of it in front of you. So even if you're only watching and you didn't write any of it, I'd expect you to know some C. But this technique is going to work for you in every programming language you do. It's going to work for you in pretty much every engineering discipline you could do. It's going to work in every science. So it's, and it's going to work in just like business as well. Like how do we solve the problem of our current staffing needs? And this is actually going to work. You know, so I think that this is the kind of thing that you can you can take away from this, and it's probably gonna like if you can master this technique, it's gonna make you better at all of your subjects. So hopefully, comes in handy. Um, I think I've said everything that I wanted to say in the live stream. We do have a few people watching at the moment. If anyone has any questions about a what I've done today, or b um, uh, anything that you want to ask about, like anything in the course that you want me to go over or um, anything to do with the exam coming up or anything like that. Although a lot of your exam questions are going to get answered in the lecture. But anyway, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now and I'll cover them. Otherwise, we will wrap up here. So I'll just wait a moment and see if anyone's got anything. Just seeing the last question there was from Cameron saying, where is the donation button? <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks very much for coming along, everyone. I hope that um, assignment two is going well and um, we'll be talking through this week in lectures. We'll be talking through... Um, Oh, thanks, Cam. It's better than Echo 360. I think that's the lecture recording thing. Uh, you know why? I think it's because I've got this little camera of my face down in the bottom corner there. And so it's kind of like you get to see a bit of um, um, a bit of what I'm actually look liking, looking like in my hand gestures and stuff like that that I make along with the, um, the, the what I'm showing on my screen. Anyway, thanks for coming, everyone. I will wrap it up there. And... Um, Good luck with everything, and I'll see you in lectures this week.